Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. We begin this evening by looking at the relationship between climate and agriculture. Let's begin by talking about climate and then we'll examine the differences in agricultural systems. The physical environment has a huge impact on the ability of land to support human populations. Climate is typically defined as an area's long-term pattern of weather. An area's climate is usually described in terms of temperature, hot versus cold, and precipitation, which is the amount of rain or snowfall an area typically receives. But plants are influenced by more than just temperature and precipitation. The quality of the soil, as measured by the amount of nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, plays an important role in the success of different kinds of agriculture, helping farmers to determine the types of crops to grow or animals to raise. Topography, or an area's landforms or features, can impact agricultural activities. This includes whether land is flat, which is ideal for agriculture, or sloped, which typically isn't. Mountains, ridges, and hills limit agricultural activity and often require more human modification in order to make the land suitable for agricultural production. If an area is sloped toward or away from the sun, along with the elevation, that can also influence temperature. As elevation increases, the growing season typically becomes shorter as temperatures decrease and precipitation falls as snow rather than as rain. But generally, mountainous areas are often unable to support agricultural activities, which was why we included it with the non-acumen zones earlier this year. As an important note, climates vary considerably across the planet, generally changing as distance from the equator increases. So as latitudes increase, climate zones often change, which affects the average temperature and precipitation, leading to different agricultural activities. So now let's take a look at a map of agricultural systems around the world. What kind of patterns do you notice here? Take a moment, write down some observations. I do believe that you should be prepared to identify the agricultural systems on this map and where they're practiced. But this is a categorical map without any political boundaries. So be prepared that they may give you a national map with only a single agricultural system shaded for you to identify. As always, be prepared to think like a geographer. Hopefully, you notice that there's a strong correlation between certain types of climate regions on the last map and specific agricultural systems on this one. We're going to look at a few specific examples in just a few minutes, but a couple important notes first. While climate is the major factor that dictates agricultural activities, with advances in technology, farmers can overcome climate. In Iceland and Greenland, for example, farmers can grow crops in greenhouses. Canada has very large indoor growing facilities. And humans can modify the landscape for agriculture through the clearing of land, piping in of irrigation to areas where water supply is limited, or draining wetlands where water is too abundant as well as adding fertilizers to enhance soil fertility. In mountainous areas, humans have carved steps into hillsides called terracing to create additional arable land. But with human modification factored in, the physical environment still dictates a lot of agricultural activities. 
but this presents an opportunity to point out the importance of accelerating climate change. If climates continue to change, then agricultural regions will shift. For example, we will see that the northern latitudes will become warmer and agricultural activities will shift as a result. For example, wheat farming that we currently see in the interior of the United States may continue to shift further north into Canada. But let's take a look at some climate regions as they stand right now and a few of the activities we may find there. Really pay attention to the details in these pictures so you can see the visual differences in agricultural activities and their corresponding climate regions. Let's start with the lowest latitude areas within the tropics. We see warm temperatures and abundant rainfall. Shifting cultivation is practiced in the tropics. You may be more familiar with the name slash and burn agriculture, which is another name for shifting cultivation. Plantations are another agricultural system found in the tropics. It is possible that you may need to know crops that are associated with each climate and agricultural system. Like coffee is grown on plantations in fairly mountainous and hilly areas within the tropics. And that's often in developing countries. But the coffee is then exported and consumed in more developed countries. Subtropical areas are adjacent to the tropics and also have abundant rain and mild temperatures. Probably the most widely grown crop in this region is rice, often called paddy rice or wet rice. This is because the lowland variety of rice requires abundant water. A perfect example is that the coastal areas of India, which receive abundant rainfall and water, can produce rice, but the interior of the country, up in the higher elevations of the Deccan Plateau, do not receive nearly as much water, so farmers there will grow wheat. From regions with abundant water to areas with very little water, the arid and semi-arid climates do not have enough water to grow crops, so these regions are known for domesticated animals. Nomadic pastoralism is a form of agriculture that relies on herds of animals like cattle, camels, reindeer, goats, yaks, and sheep. These animals produce goods like milk, cheese, butter, along with things like hide and hair. The animals are only killed when necessary and often the meat is traded for other commodities like grain. We also see in this same climate region livestock ranching, which is different than nomadic herding. Ranching occurs when large numbers of animals, like cattle and pigs, are raised for slaughter and the sale of meat. Warm mid-latitude areas are similar to the subtropics because there are mild temperatures. These areas are known for fruits and vegetables, like the orange groves that you see here. Cold mid-latitudes are also in the mid-latitude range, but are generally colder in temperature and perhaps have less abundant precipitation. You see wheat fields like the one shown here in areas in the United States, but also in China where there's a very similar climate. The Mediterranean climate has hot, dry summers and mild, wet winters. This climate is great for growing vine and tree crops like grapes, which can be used for wine, olives, figs, as well as other crops like wheat, and for the raising of animals like lambs and goats, which are used for both meat and cheese. But practices might be different. For example, California grows very similar products to other Mediterranean regions but California requires significantly more irrigation to produce these same type of crops. And while Iceland and Canada might be able to produce these crops in greenhouses, 
they are not able to produce the same volume as the tropical plantations or Mediterranean farms, and thus aren't able to effectively compete within the global marketplace. There are two major physical forces that have always shaped agriculture, climate and topography or landforms. We just looked at those. Another force is economics. And we will be talking about this pretty much throughout the remainder of our agriculture unit. To begin the conversation on economic forces that influence agricultural activities, we need to examine the differences between extensive and intensive agriculture. Extensive agriculture is a form of agriculture characterized by fewer inputs of capital and paid labor relative to the amount of space being used. So extensive forms of agriculture generally do not require as much money, known as capital, or labor. Because they do not need as much labor, they're often located farther from population centers, such as cities. This land, due to its distance from cities, tends to be cheaper, and thus plots of land tend to be larger. The biggest feature is that extensive agriculture generates a lower output or yield per acre. And because the output per acre is low, these forms of agriculture typically need lots of land to be profitable. Some examples include nomadic pastoralism and livestock ranching because livestock like cattle or sheep need large pastures to graze on. Wheat farming is considered extensive, as is shifting cultivation. In fact, shifting cultivation and nomadic pastoralism occupy the largest percentage of the world's land area that is dedicated to agriculture. Take a look at our agriculture map and you'll see huge areas devoted to slash and burn agriculture as well as nomadic herding. Intensive agriculture, on the other hand, is a form of agriculture characterized by greater inputs of capital and paid labor relative to the space being used. Intensive agriculture typically requires significantly greater inputs either of labor or money. As a result, intensive agriculture typically occurs closer to large numbers of people. This in turn makes land more expensive, so plots of land tend to be smaller. Consequently, and most importantly, output is higher per acre. So some examples include rice farming, market gardening, plantation agriculture, and mixed crop and livestock. Rice farming provides a staple for many people, but is very labor intensive, so it requires a lot of people often harvesting by hand. Market gardening, on the other hand, is more capital intensive, needing lots of machinery and vehicles to get fruits and vegetables to market before they go bad. Plantations often harvest cash crops like sugar, coffee, tea, and cacao. Mixed crop and livestock is intensive because the crops, like corn and soybeans, are used as feed for the animals. The animals are then sold for meat as that generates the maximum profit. But no part of the land is unused, which differentiates it from livestock ranching mentioned previously. One technique to maximize output on a small amount of land is known as double cropping, which is harvesting twice a year from the same field. We see this often with rice paddies as the climate does not limit production to a single season. Another technique is known as intercropping or multi-cropping, when farmers grow two or more crops simultaneously in the same field. Increased land use intensity is a common response to population growth. In fact, Esther Bosrup, a critic of Thomas Malthus, argued that Population growth independently forces a conversion from extensive to intensive subsistence agriculture. 
This has allowed many areas that are undergoing rapid population growth to remain within their carrying capacity and to feed the growing population. And that will do it for tonight. Have a good evening, everyone, and I'll see you back in class.